Hi, fifth grade. Today I'm going to introduce a battle book called Night Books by J.A. White. It was listed as one of the battle books this summer, but um, if you didn't read it this summer, you can always read it during the school year. And if you have already read it, I would love to know your thoughts and opinions about it. I would love to know whether you recommend it to others and what kind of people you would recommend it to. Some people love adventure books and some people love mysteries and love some people like realistic fiction, some people like graphic novels. If you have somebody in mind that you think would really, really, really like this book, let me know so that I can share your opinions with the rest of the grade. All right, so if you look at the title, Night Books, and then underneath the picture, you see it kind of looks like a keyhole, right? But inside the keyhole, you see this spiral sta staircase, and then you also see all of these books, all these bookshelves housing lots and lots of books. And then you have this kid, the silhouette of a, of a kid looking at all these books. And then you see the same picture inside, but again, there's, n there aren't, um, there's the keyhole, but there aren't the, there aren't the books. And I didn't actually notice, there is this cat right here, see? There's a cat, and the cat does reappear on this page. I also really like this book because the chapters are titled really unique titles. Some books just have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but this book, each chapter stands out because of the way it's named. I'm going to read The Wrong Floor to you today. The Wrong Floor. After his family had fallen asleep, Alex slung the backpack over his shoulder and snuck out of the apartment, easing the front door gently home so it didn't slam shut. So he's sneaking out. The eighth floor hallway looked drearier than ever without any sunlight coming through its small windows. Alex lingered on the doormat, fighting the urge to return to his warm, comfortable bed. So he's actually having second thoughts. It sounds like he wants to leave. He's decided to leave. And now he's thinking, oh, maybe I want to go back to my comfortable bed. He's fighting the urge to return. If you do that, he thought, you'll still be the same old Alex Mosher tomorrow. Weirdo, freak, loser. Is that what you want? And it's in italics, which means this is what he's thinking in his head. No, he whispered to himself. Before he could change his mind, Alex started toward the elevator at the end of the hall. During the day, snippets of his neighbors' lives leaked through the thin doors, muffled conversations, the loud blare of televisions, Mrs. Garcia's son practicing his violin. At this time of night, however, the hallway was nearly silent. The only sounds were a grimy light bulb that buzzed like an angry hornet and a soft rustling from Alex's backpack as though its contents were struggling to escape their fate. I wonder what's in, their back, in the backpack. Sorry, Alex thought to himself, feeling a wave of guilt. I wish I didn't have to do this, but it's better this way. He reached the elevator and pressed the down button on the cracked panel. Far below him, ancient gears squealed away the silence. Alex winced and peeked over his shoulder, hoping that the sound didn't wake any of his neighbors. The stair would have been a quieter option, but Alex wanted to reach his destination as quickly as possible, so he didn't have the opportunity to second guess his decision. Ding! The elevator doors jerked open with a pained squeak. Smudged mirrors paneled the walls. Alex stepped inside and clicked the B button. The basement was his favorite place in the entire apartment building. It was spooky and weird and packed ceiling high with towers of knickknacks left behind by former tenants, like a graveyard for unwanted items. The most amazing part, however, was the boiler an iron monster built nearly 60 years ago. Alex called it Old Smoky. It was his destination tonight. The elevator doors closed and the car began to descend in slow, jerky increments. Alex tapped his foot impatiently. Though his backpack was far lighter than usual, it seemed to weigh him down like an anchor. I'll feel better after they're gone, he thought. Just toss them in the flames and walk away. Don't even stick around to watch them burn. Of course, 
Alex could have dumped the contents of his backpack down the trash chute and had been done with it, but that seemed cruel. Cremating them in Old Smoky felt more honorable, like setting the body of a fallen warrior aflame. Alex figured he owed them a good death, at least. After all, he was the one who had created them. The elevator stopped. The doors creaked open. Alex tilted his head in confusion. So what's in his backpack? And what does he want to put in Old Smoky? Alex tilted his head in confusion. Instead of the basement, an unfamiliar hallway stretched out before him. He checked the digital display at the top of the elevator. Four. Must be broken, he thought, jabbing the B button with his index finger. The elevator didn't move. Alex sighed <sighs> with frustration. Looks like I'm taking the stairs after all, he thought. He stepped off the elevator and headed toward the stairwell. The fourth floor had the same basic layout as the eighth, but it was noticeably darker. Alex glanced up at the light bulbs, wondering if a few of them had burned out, but they seemed to be working fine. For some strange reason, however, their glow didn't radiate as far as it should, as though the darkness of this particular hallway was harder to penetrate than the ordinary kind. Just my crazy imagination, Alex thought, ignoring the cold sensation creeping down his spine. The bulbs are probably just old, or he heard voices. The voices were coming from the apartment at the end of the hall. At first, Alex thought it was just the people who lived there. But as he got closer, creepy music rose in the background, and Alex realized that the voices belonged to characters from a movie. He broke into a big grin as he recognized the dialogue. That's Night of the Living Dead, he thought. Alex had been four years old the first time he saw the movie. He was supposed to have fallen asleep, but the strange sounds coming from the living room had piqued his curiosity, and so he had crept out of bed to investigate. His mom and dad were cuddled up on the couch, sharing a bowl of popcorn. Alex hid behind his dad's easy chair and trained his eyes on the television. He had never been so terrified or exhilarated in his life. By the time his parents realized that they had an unwelcome visitor, it was too late. Alex was in love. At the end of the month, his Thomas trains had been exiled to a bin in the basement, replaced by toy monsters, plastic fangs, and a stuffed ghost named Boo. He dismantled his Lego fire trucks and rocket ships and used the bricks to build a haunted house. At the library, Alex insisted on borrowing only the picture books with little Halloween labels on their spines, despite that it was June. Night of the Living Dead had been his introduction to the world of creepy things, and for that reason, it held a special place in his heart. Hearing it now, an overpowering desire to watch the movie again fogged all other thoughts. Alex approached the door of the apartment 4E, a static-filled soundtrack reeling him in like a fishing line, and pressed his ear against it. It was one of the earliest scenes in the movie, just before Barbara and her brother are attacked by a zombie at the graveyard. I've barely missed anything at all, Alex thought with excitement. He had, for this moment, forgotten completely about his backpack and his reason for coming out tonight. All he could think about was the movie. He was desperate to see it. If Alex had been thinking clearly, he might have realized that this didn't make any sense. After all, he could watch Night of the Living Dead anytime he wanted to. On his iPad, surely there was better there's a better choice than knocking on strangers' doors in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, Alex was not thinking clearly. His green eyes, usually so sharp and inquisitive behind their glasses, had gone uncharacteristically flat, and his mouth hung open in a baffled expression giving him a striking resemblance to one of the zombies from the movie. Alex knocked on the door with three quick taps. A woman answered, almost immediately, as though she had been expecting his arrival. Well, look at this, she peered down at him, a visitor. The woman was in her late 20s with dark skin and short, spiky hair. She wore all black and a lot of makeup, especially around the eyes. I'm sorry, Alex said, his mind whirling, swirling. What am I doing here, he thought. I, I don't know why I knocked. I just, I just heard, what did you hear? 
she asked, leaning towards him with an eager expression. Tell me. The movie. The woman smiled. There were tiny gaps between her narrow teeth, giving her the look of one of those weird, glowing fish that prowl the deepest parts of the ocean. A movie? She asked with genuine curiosity. That's new. Which one? Alex gave the woman a strange look. You could still hear the television blaring behind her. The zombie now banging on the window of Barbara's car, yet she was acting like she heard nothing at all. Don't, don't you know? Alex asked. Why should I? The movie's for you, not me. She opened the door wider. You want to watch it? She asked. I bet it's one of your favorites. A beam of fear cut through the fog of Alex's thoughts. It's the middle of the night and I'm having a conversation with a total stranger like it's the most normal thing in the world, he thought. What is wrong with me? He took a step back, intending to leave as quickly as possible when he smelled something wonderful coming from the apartment. Freshly baked pumpkin pie, his favorite. He breathed in the comforting smells of nutmeg and cinnamon and all of his fears evaporated. This, this woman isn't a threat, he thought to himself. She's just a nice lady who, who likes horror movies, like me. The movie's Night of the Living Dead, Alex said. 1968, directed by George Romero. Ah, said the woman, how intriguing. And was I right? Is it one of your favorites? Top 10, right between Let the Right One In and The Ring. Alex shrugged apologetically. I like scary stuff. You sound like my kind of kid, the woman replied, grinning. It's crazy. I was just about to kick back and watch the movie when I thought, the only thing missing is someone to share this with, someone who really appreciates it. And here you are. She opened the door all the way, allowing Alex a view of a comfortable looking couch and a coffee table piled with oatmeal raisin cookies and pumpkin pie. Across from this cozy setup, a huge TV played the black and white images he longed to see. Barbara staggering toward the farmhouse where she would be trapped for the rest of the movie with zombies in hot pursuit. Alex took a step forward entranced. Well, don't just stand there gawking, silly boy, the woman said. Come inside. Even later, when Alex knew that he had been under the influence of a powerful spell, he found it hard to believe that he had entered the apartment so easily. At the time, it was like his body was not his own, but a moth, drawn to the flickering light of the television. He crossed the threshold. The door clicked shut behind him. Gotcha, the woman said under her breath. So I guess she probably said gotcha, the woman said under her breath. She slipped a cold hand around his wrist, and all the energy seemed to leave his body. Alex sank into the cushions of a nearby couch, barely able to keep his eyes open. The woman eased into the chair across from him. The smile had faded from her lips. What's your name? She asked. Alexander. Alex. Which one? Alex. He looked around the apartment in confusion. The television had vanished, along with a coffee table and the pumpkin pie. Where, where did the TV go? Alex said. It was never there. No, he insisted. I saw it. The apartment does what it can to get you inside. Different for everyone. A movie is an odd choice. Traditionally, it's some sort of food that draws them in. Kids are always thinking with their stomachs, you know. I, I smell pumpkin pie. There you go. It was becoming harder for Alex to focus. The room kept tilting back and forth. Like when you first step off a pirate ship ride at an amusement park, he felt like he might be ill. I, I want to go home, he said. Obviously, that's not going to happen, Alex. He turned in his seat, moving impossibly slow, hoping to make a mad dash for the door, except the door had vanished. The place where it had once stood was nothing but a blank wall. Where did the door go? He asked groggily. Away? The woman said, don't worry, you won't be needing it anymore. But that's not possible, 
Alex said. Doors don't just, they, they can't. Haven't you figured it out yet? She asked, grinning with pride. I'm a witch, just like in a storybook. She touched a single fingernail to his forehead and you, little mouse, have fallen right into my trap. Alex tried to stand, but his legs had turned to jelly and he collapsed to the floor instead. A wave of darkness crashed over him. What a good way to end chapter one. So if this interested you, if you thought, oh, I want to read the next chapter when I was reading this, if you're thinking, I got to get my hands on this book, then what you need to do is you need to get in touch with Miss Frank's the librarian, get onto the library resources on my collegiate, and ask that you want this book and get it and read it and tell me all about it. All right, bye.